Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So Monish Pabrai has been doing a four-part interview with Everything Money. And in the video released today, December 21st, Pabrai basically told us exactly why he sold Alibaba in the third quarter of 2021. So big news here. I mean, this is something that so many of us were wondering. Why did Pabrai sell such a huge stake of Alibaba? in the third quarter when he seemed so bullish on the company. So I'm gonna kind of walk through what he said about why he sold. Uh, it's all here in the video, and then I'm gonna give sort of some additional thoughts um, on what Pabrai said and didn't say in this uh, interview. So he starts off by saying, one thing to keep in mind about investing in general, there's a very strong signal value when someone buys something. Okay, now Pabrai has talked about this many times before. Uh, if someone buys something, if it shows up on their 13F as a buy or an ad, uh, there's really only one reason they do that. Okay, they like the investment prospects of that business. Um, there's many reasons a fund manager or an investor will sell. Okay, and Pabrai gave a few reasons that he sold Alibaba just recently. So it's interesting that he set it up that way uh, because as he was saying that, I was thinking, oh, okay. So he sold Alibaba not really because of the merit of, of the investment. Um, it was for some other reason, but that, that, wasn't, that wasn't exactly true. So I found that interesting. Uh, he says, in the case of Alibaba, one of the reasons I sold was for tax loss harvesting. Okay, and that's, that's really what I assumed it was a big part of the reason. I made a video about that um, a month or two ago, I think, when I found out that Pabrai sold out uh, of the vast majority of his stake in Alibaba. Because Alibaba has dropped so much since Pabrai bought, uh, he's able to really take advantage of showing a loss selling Alibaba um, to offset some of his gains for tax purposes. So uh, he also mentioned, you know, when you sell for tax loss harvesting, you have to wait 30 days to buy back in. That's kind of the rules uh, when you're doing tax loss harvesting. Um, now, the second reason aside from tax loss harvesting, I had studied and learned about Tencent and Prosus, which is a play on Tencent, uh, after we had made the Alibaba investment, okay? So he buys into Alibaba, I think largely cloning Charlie Munger. I'm sure he had conversations with Charlie as well. Um, but, you know, I think buying Alibaba made him notice Tencent, as well, right? The two really big tech players in China. And the more he drilled down into Tencent's business model uh, with the help of Kuz Becker uh, at Naspers, um, he liked the business more, right? So he said, after we made the Alibaba investment, the stock went down and process Tencent also went down, okay? So that's great. Now he gets to lock in a tax loss harvest with Alibaba and use those proceeds from the sale to buy in to Tencent through Prosys, um, which is kind of best of both worlds, right? You get the, the perk of the tax loss harvest. You also get to buy the business you really want to own, which is Tencent, uh, at, at the same low price, right? So um, worked out very well. He says, I sold Alibaba, I moved the proceeds to Prosys because uh, he likes Prosys even better than Tencent. He talks about that uh, in past Q&A sessions as well. And I never need to buy Alibaba back again because I thought the Tencent business model is superior to the Alibaba business. So, you know, when Pabrai first sold, I had speculated, you know, it was probably... A, a big reason was the tax loss harvest and maybe he'll buy back in, right? It doesn't seem like he's interested in buying back in. So I don't expect him to do that because uh, he's very happy to own Tencent 
instead of Alibaba. And it seems like, for whatever reason, he doesn't want to own both. Uh, I don't know if this, it's that he just doesn't want that much exposure to China. Uh, I know he tends to be more focused on small caps, uh, which neither Alibaba or Tencent clearly fit into that uh, small cap bucket. Um, I killed multiple birds with one stone, moving from a business that's good to a business that's even better. Okay, from Alibaba to Tencent. I get the tax loss harvest, and I would have been willing to buy Prosys at the higher price back when he was buying Alibaba. Uh, but he got it at a lower price after it's been coming down because of everything that's been going on in China, investors fleeing from China. So that's all great. Okay. Next, he's asked, what are investors missing about Tencent? And this question, I was like, oh man, I wish I was the one who was interviewing Pabrai right now. Because Pabrai laid all of this out in this talk in November at Boston College, right? He laid out his whole thesis for Tencent. And he basically did that again uh, with everything money, which is kind of a missed opportunity, right? If they had just watched that, if they already understood how Pabrai saw Tencent and the business model and his investment thesis for Tencent, they could have gone maybe a little bit deeper, but I can't hold it against them too much. I mean, you know, who else was Pabrai going to talk to about, you know, why he sold Alibaba? So that in and of itself, they own a, they, they deserve a huge round of applause for that. But this, this moment was kind of like, ah, if only you had done a little bit more research. So anyway, uh, just kind of recapping what Pabrai sees in Tencent. He says, Tencent is a mystery because they don't really explain the business, okay? And, you know, part of what Pabrai was talking about in that lecture at Boston College was uh, he had seen this talk from Peter Thiel uh, where monopolies don't want people to know their monopolies, okay? Uh, a monopoly business wants to tell the world hey, you know, we're not a monopoly. We have all of this competition, right? Poor us. And it's the crappy businesses, the businesses that don't have any monopoly, any advantage, uh, that like to point out, hey, look at us, we're a monopoly. So it's kind of opposite land in that respect. Now, uh, right, the Tencent doesn't want the attention. They don't want the attention from competition. Uh, they don't want attention from regulators, government, the CCP. Um, in the case of Tencent, I was able to figure out their business model because of comments that Coos Becker at Naspers made. So after Pabrai looks at, say, 20 years of annual reports and transcripts, you know, everything that Pony Ma has said about the business, um, he, he really can't sink his teeth into the business still. Okay, Pony Ma... It isn't giving him anything to chew on to really understand the Tencent business model. Kuz Becker, on the other hand, who through Naspers has owned uh, Tencent for like 20 years, right? And Kuz Becker, you know, has, has spoken about Pony Ma and Tencent and what makes it a great business in ways that Pony Ma has no incentive to do, to, to, to share. Um, so that was really the way that Pabrai was able to understand what Tencent does and why it's such an incredible business. Um, Tencent is simple, right? They have two business models. The first is they have an army of software engineers, right? And you go, go look at this Boston College lecture. He goes deeper into this as well. Uh, the army of software engineers... Uh, generate about 65% annual returns, okay? And that's the capital that's deployed into hiring these software engineers uh, and paying their salaries. They're generating 65% returns on that capital. Uh, unfortunately, they can only use a small sliver of all of the capital available to Tencent to grow that particular business, uh, that army of software engineers. So the rest, they plow into these digital Warren Buffets, as Pabrai called them in that lecture 
at Boston College. Uh, and that's, you know, owning private companies in the digital space, um, buying into public companies, so, so taking a minority stake in other public companies uh, in the digital landscape. And that's generating 35% annual returns on invested capital. Um, he says there are only two companies out of the large tech giants who are really good at allocating capital. Okay, That's Tencent and Amazon. And he points out in this lecture at Boston College, if you look at the balance sheets for Tencent and Amazon, and then you look at Google and Facebook, and you know whatever other tech giant you want to look at, um, Amazon and Tencent are the only ones that have net debt. Okay, all of the others are flush in cash on the balance sheet, and the reason for that is Tencent has these opportunities to redeploy that capital at high rates of return, uh, and that's unusual, right? They're kind of in a unique position in that way to be able to reinvest at such high rates. Uh, and that's such an edge. That is such an edge over time for a business to be able to do that. Uh, I like this point as well. Amazon is not as good as, at, as Tencent, right? But Bryce says, you know, these two businesses are, are, are both um, good at capital allocation. But Tencent is better. And the reason for that is... Uh, Amazon puts a lot of money into non-digital businesses, okay? Tencent only wants to put money into software, guys. And it's pretty easy to understand why. So if you hire a software engineer, the asymmetry of your inputs and outputs with a really good software engineer, I mean, you're going to hit it out of the park, okay? Um, that's just the nature of being a software engineer, right? A great software engineer can put out a thousand X or create a thousand times more value than say an average software engineer. It's just, it's a highly leveraged skill. Uh, and Naval talks about this quite a bit as well. Uh, as with Amazon, where you're hiring, you know, warehouse employees, delivery drivers, uh, you can't get that asymmetric output compared to input. Uh, so it's a much more compelling uh, return scenario with, with Tencent than it is with Amazon. Um, he says Alibaba is not as digital as Tencent. This is where he's comparing Alibaba to Tencent. Capital allocation engine is more sporadic for Alibaba. Uh, they have a lot of cash. Once in a while, a deal comes along, right? It makes me kind of think of Berkshire Hathaway where they have all of this cash. Uh, they would love to deploy it, um, but in this market, there just, there aren't any compelling opportunities to deploy that capital. They, they really, they're at the mercy of a great deal coming along. Whereas with Tencent, they've got these two engines just humming. Uh, where there's always things to do with the capital. So, again, such a fantastic position to be in. Uh, Tencent deliberately takes all the cash it has and pumps it out. This redeployment engine gives it a huge edge, right? It's that whole return on reinvested capital that Guy Spear was talking about recently uh, that really just fuels the compound growth engine. Uh, that ability to reinvest earnings back into the business uh, in high return on capital, um, you know, businesses. Uh, I preferred the 10 cent bet, so I made the switch. I wish I had been more aggressive with that switch. I'm not sure what he means by that. Maybe he wishes he had sold the entire Alibaba position. I think he sold like 82%, if I recall correctly. Uh, but I'm not fully sure what he's saying with this statement. I wish I'd been more aggressive with that switch. Um, and then lastly, he bought Prosys. So it seems clear that he bought Prosys via Amsterdam uh, because he said, I don't think it trades in the U.S. 
Uh, and my understanding, it does trade in the U.S. It trades through a ticker P-R-O-S-Y, PROSI, uh, is the over-the-counter version of PROSIS that can be bought here in the U.S. Um, but since Pabrai didn't know about that, seems like he bought through Amsterdam. So it's not something we're going to be seeing on his 13Fs. Uh, we're probably not even going to see it in ticker because... Um, what he would have invested in it, let's say he invested 50 million, uh, it's just not enough uh, for it to be required to be disclosed uh, as a percentage of that ownership in process. So, um, yeah, just fantastic stuff. I'm so glad Everything Money did this interview. Um, yeah, wow, what a day. What a day to be able to really peer into the exact thought process uh, with regards to Monish Babrai and that sale of Alibaba. So huge shout out to them. Definitely watch the entire series. Um, I'm going to be making highlight videos uh, from each one. This one had to jump to the front of the line because, I mean, it's such, it's such big news uh, to really understand that sell decision behind Alibaba for Monish Pabrai. Uh, poor Charlie, though. Poor Charlie, he's, he's left holding the bag on Alibaba, right? Um, who knows? Maybe we'll see Daily Journal buy into Tencent now. That, that would be fascinating to see. I'm not holding my breath for that, but uh, it'd be awesome to see, you know, the guru, the guy who sits behind Monish Pabrai every day, buy something that Monish Pabrai kind of did the, did the real legwork on. That would be a fascinating scenario. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Uh, happy holidays to all of you. And I've had a question, actually. Um, so Santa Claus is, is quite a big character here in the U.S., and he wears this big coat, right? It makes sense. I'm in Chicago now. It is cold here. And for those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, what does Santa wear? at Christmas time. I mean, it can't be a big coat, right? It's summer there. So let me know in the comments if any of you, you know, send me a picture of Santa. I mean, is he in like cabana wear on the beach? What, what's going on with Santa this time of year? Uh, but anyway, guys, I will leave it there and I will see you all in the next one. Take care.